we'll ask ourselves a question. And the question will be, so what is it we can do if reincarnation is true, and we've looked you know, into the scriptures and we've seen that it is, and if in, in these human lives that we have, uh, things are not going well, for example, what's happening right now, for no, no fault of our own, those of us who are listening, we're so scared and uncertain because of this pandemic that has, that has come through and, and we don't know where it came from. All we're trying to do is take precautions and, and ensure that we do all the right things and hope that we're not in a position where um, this thing is transmissible to us um, from anyone or any source. But some other people who live in life today, are, they face so many other disasters. Um, maybe this is the first for us, it's a pandemic. Right in our lifespan in the last you know, few years, in this country and so many other countries in the world, and there's been a 9-11, and there's been um, tsunamis, and there's been you know, shootings and schools and movie theaters, and some people right in this country we live today may have gone through all of those just in one lifetime, just in the span of a few years. And so for these people, life is a tremendous test. It's a disaster, some people would put it. That how many things can we tolerate in one life? That is why the ancient rishis say that this human life is a suffering. While it is an opportunity, we suffer in this lifetime because of all these complexities and calamities and disasters. And so some of us may not agree because there are others who lead a very happy life. But some people are finding it very difficult. To the point where some may say, I know enough people who would have said that I really don't want to be born into this world again. I prefer to, if I'm able to, I prefer to join God in his abode and live happily ever after, where there's no pain, there's no uncertainty, there are no pandemics, there's only love, <clears throat> there's only happiness and the company of God. So this verse that we chanted was from uh, chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 of Bhagavad Gita for those of us who would like to say that, look, um, I'd like to join Bhagavan in his abode after this life, then that is possible. And for those of us who don't even know that that is possible, then it is saying recipe. And the recipe is that those who uh, dedicate all their actions to me, regarding me as a supreme goal, worshiping me and meditating on me, um, those people who have exclusive devotion, what would happen? He's telling Arjun, Mrityu Sansara Sagarat, the verse 7 says in chapter 12, that I will deliver these people, these devotees of mine, from the ocean of birth and death. Why? because their consciousness is united with me. Uh, just, just mind these few words, their consciousness is united with me. And for that reason, they will be, um, they will come to me. So we understand that as people who are aspirants, but then today we also have the young children. The young children in this country, especially in this country or North America, or maybe everywhere by now, the young man or the young woman says that, why should I have to make changes uh, to secure that in my perception is, is an unknown? Many people say this, a past life is an unknown, a future life is an unknown. I'm happy the way I am. Why do I have to make changes to ensure that I fall within the category of what is described by Bhagavan to qualify us for um, a person whose consciousness is united with God? Because the young people today, they don't want to do what we're doing, especially for us West Indians. Um, the way we worship Indians as well, but generally the way we worship, young people are mostly hesitant. Um, to worship like us. So we have to find a way, um, you know, the, the child can come to the parent and, and say that, that I, I don't want to do all these things you're doing. I'm willing to be a Hindu. I'm willing to be, you know, whatever religion you belong to. 
but I, I want to find an easier way. So they say that I know and care only about this life. A child is saying to you. Well, first of all, the scripture can disprove that because we use this verse a few weeks ago, chapter uh, 12, chapter 2 rather, in, uh, um, verse 12. Uh, Bhagavad Gita says that Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna not at any time in the future shall we or any of us cease to exist. So that proves that in the future there is a future. There is a future for us and we'll exist again in the future. That very verse says Natvevaham Jatu Nasam. That Arjuna, there was never a time when I did not exist. So just in case we didn't listen last week and we we're talking about the last life, then Bhagavad Gita says there was a last life as well. So the young person says that mom or dad, why not just worship the way uh, you worship now? Um, because Bhagavad Gita is saying that you should give the mind to me. You have to do all these things. You know, if you're devoted to me, then your consciousness will be um, united with me. And so for those of us who are worshipping, who grew up with this conditioning and worshipping the way we worship, the question crops up in our mind then, um, why can't we just worship the way we've, we have been doing? Whether it's bhakti or not, that look, it's worship and it's God's work. This will be your argument. Because not only that bhakti is necessary, the answer to that will be, that, that bhakti is necessary, but, it's, but it's, it's our best shot, rather, for the lack of a better term, for a win-win situation, a win-win result. And the reason why I said that is, and this is a Ramayana quote that helps us to understand why we can use such a statement as it's a win-win situation, it's actually our best shot. Ramayana tells us, Krita Yoga Sab Jogi Vigyani Kari Hari Dhyan Tarahi Bhav Prani So, Krita Yoga Sab Jogi Vigyani That Satyug, in Satyug, in the first age, everyone was possessed of mystic powers. Everyone was wise. And so because they had the necessary knowledge, appropriate knowledge as to how to attain God, then they sat quietly and they meditated upon God's actions and his leelas and all the things that the scripture said, and they were able, because they were yogi and bigyani. So they did dhyan, what literally translates to being meditation, and they were able to attain God. But he goes on to say that was satyug, and then the second one is... Treta bibidha jagya nar karahi Prabhuhi samar pahi karma bhavatarahi In Treta Yuga, this is the second age, after Sat Yuga, that men perform sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Treta bibidha jagya kar, jagya nar karahi. Jagya means yagya that we perform. You know, today yagya is, has a slightly... Um, different understanding, technically a yagya is when we do havan, right? We make a huge havan kun and we do constant, you know, pouring into the fire, ahuti, um, what we call havan, pouring ingredients and ghee into the fire, that is yagya, right? The rest of it is bhagwat, this is when we do pravachan, um, we examine the scriptures, we call a vyas, etc. Um, but the yagya is when we pour oblations into the fire. So in Treta Yuga, Jagya Narakadahi, men attain God by doing Yagya. In Dwapar Yuga, in the third age, Dwapar Kari Raghupati Par Puja Narabhavatarahi Upayan Duja. In the third age, men also People also attain God, but how did they do that? They did that by Raghupati Pada Puja. They did Puja. You know what Puja we do today? Men perform Puja at the feet, Raghupati Pada. 
uh, at the feet of Bhagwan, and they were able to attain God. So those were the recipes that are given or that were prevalent in those days when men attain God and how they attain God. Interestingly, however, in this age that we lived in, Kali Yuga, which started just more than 5,000 years ago when Bhagavan Sri Krishna left the world, this age is called Kali Yuga. And it, in, in Uttar Khand of, of, of Ram Charitmanas, there's a, a beautiful example as to what do we do as human beings? What is the recipe for us to attain God? We examine the words of Tulsi Dazi and see what is it that we are supposed to do to attain God. about Satyug, we talked about Dwapar, we talked about Treta, and this Chaupai tells us Kali Yuga Keval Hari Gunagana. How do we attain God or His grace or His blessings, eternal blessings in Kali Yuga? Keval means only. So Kali Yuga Keval is very simple. Hari Gunagana. By chanting lovingly the names of God. Kali Yuga Keval Hari Gunagana. Why chanting? Because the idea if we were listening, if you remember the verse from the beginning, the idea is to remember God, to offer um, our sincerity through mental worship, through our mind. So, Hari Gunagana, if we just chant the name, just, just chant the name, just say God's names and we'll be okay. We'll attain his abode. The science is that when you call upon someone, if you're calling on your son, your child, your parents, whoever it is, what is the first mental process upon calling on, your, on someone? First, a person has to think of that person, right? We don't just scream out the name. If we want to call our son, we think that we need our son for whatever reason, or your daughter, or whoever it is. And then the second motion will be, now you're adding another sense to it, the sense of, you know, speaking, a voice, um, and, and so the action is completed in the same way when we chant God's name, we'll remember Bhagavan. When we say Ram, we'll remember Ram. So in, in the age of Kali Yuga, men can only attain God by remembering and, and, and by devotion to his name, devotion 
to his feet. And devotion to his feet can be done by uttering with sincerity his divine names. So, the child can come and say, okay, so I'm willing to give this a shot. Or anyone in Kalyu, if we want to attain eternal blessings. So the question will be, how can I do this? And if I do, how can I benefit from this in this life? I am not too interested in about the other life. We have a pandemic going on now. I need to feel secured and outside of all the things I'm doing. So how can I benefit from this in this life? And if I do not, what happens? If I don't take this recipe and practice it, what happens? So the first question. The first question is how can I benefit? Here's the answer from Bhagavad Gita. Ananya chintayanto maam ye jana paryupasate tesham nittay bhukta naam yoga kshemam maham yaham. Verse 22, chapter 9, Bhagavad Gita. Sri so Krishna says, there are those who always think of me, Arjun, and they engage their mind in exclusive devotion to me. So this is what we're talking about, merging the consciousness in, in God's remembrance. That purifies the consciousness, rather. So, Teshang Nitte Bhuktanang Yoga Kshemam Bahamiham. Sri Krishna says, Yoga Kshemam, that to them, to those devotees whose minds are always absorbed in me, I provide what they don't have and I protect what they already possess. So the question is, how can I benefit? That is how you can benefit, just by doing bhakti. Remember, our topic is bhakti, mental worship, a way that the, the, the young person in this country um, or any other country who, who's not interested in worshiping the way we worship, you know, with our conditioning. It is, it is, it is, it is not unfair to say that we, the way we worship can be complicated if it is not explained properly. And so Bhagavan says, if you do bhakti, just mental engagement with me, I will protect what you have and I will provide what you don't have. So the second question the child may ask is that if I don't follow this and just continue doing what I have been doing, the way I've been doing it, then what happens? Look, I do good things. Um, I do a lot of selfless work. Um, when I have time, I go to my altar, etc. If we do that without engaging the mind in God, then as we say in the world, in the business world, we say you're leaving money in the table. You know, you do a transaction, you didn't complete it properly, um, and, and so uh, you were cheated of some money. You weren't told, nor did you find out. And you left some money on the table. What I mean by that is that you might be performing, dhar performing dharmic activities now, but you're not maximizing or making yourself available to the spiritual, meaning the divine benefits and rewards that are available and that are inherent in those activities. That's why I said in the beginning, you're leaving money on the table. You've done the work. Why not maximize on its benefits? So Bhagavad Puran helps us to understand what is that, what is that money left on the table we're talking about. And it says, Dharma satyarayopeto vidyavatapasanvita madbhaktya petamanmanam nazamyak prapunati. This is Bhagavad Mahapuran, uh, Kanto 11, uh, chapter 14, verse 22 of Bhagavad Mahapuran tells us, this is the explanation, that neither religious activity is endowed with honesty and mercy, nor knowledge obtained with great penance can completely purify one's consciousness. However, it says here, 
these things cannot purify one's consciousness if they're, if they're bereft of, of, of the mindset of it being done as loving service to God. This is Bhagavad Mahapuran. So listen objectively. There are things that you may disagree with. That's fine. But these are coming from the scriptures. And like, I, like, like we always say, this is information. So listen to the information. This can make spirituality a whole lot simpler, not only for our children that we're trying to keep them engrossed in spirituality, but it can help us too. Because we'll be in a position to differentiate as to, you know, what is the correct mindset to do our worship. Remember, this is, this is our topic. This is what we're talking about, right? That their consciousness is united with me. This is what Bhagavan says in the beginning when we quoted from verse 7 of chapter 12. So your consciousness has to be united with God. So, does that mean that there's no benefit if we make offerings without a pure mind, for example, without our mind being engaged in God, does that mean we get no benefits for what we do? Well, the answer for that is tricky. The answer is that you will get benefits, but your benefits will be short-term. They'll be material. Because the law of, not only God's law, you know, cause and effect, we talked about that last week. Um, the, you know, the scientific law cause and effect. But we all know that whatever is done in God's name, whether it's a word or an action, nothing is unheard or unseen from God. So we will benefit, but we're not getting long-term benefits, divine benefits, those that will enable us to attain happiness here and to cease the sansar, the coming and going in, in this life. So... Uh, we mentioned that you have to make these offerings with a pure heart. This is what, according to our mind, this is how it is explained. Bhagavan says here, Nirmalaman, Sri Ram was telling um, Sugriv when Vivishan was coming, and the, all Sugriv saw was the brother of a demon, Ravan. Bhagavan Ram said to Sugriv, Let him come. The only thing that I, re that I recognize, Sugriv, Sri Ram is saying, Nirmalaman, Janaso Mohi Pava, that man who has a pure heart. It doesn't matter what family he came from, what side of the ocean he lives, what language he speaks, or any of those uh, pairs of opposites, um, intelligent or not, rich or poor. Um, we can go on naming the pairs. Bhagwan says that none of those matters. The only thing that matters to me, Sugriv, is Nirmalaman, a person of pure heart, will definitely be able to be in my company. Across all religions, all cultures, all probably the next uh, most uh, applicable one to us will know that the Bible, uh, the Bible says that as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for, for he shall, 
shall see God. Ramayana says this, and it says, Nirmalamanujan, anyone who has a pure heart will be able to attain me, whether you're the brother of Rakshas or not. So the question here is, the third question, we mentioned three questions in the beginning. So what are the changes I have to make? The child can ask the, the parent that. Okay, I want to be spiritual, but what are the changes do I have to make? How and when and at what cost to my material progress, the adult my, might ask, in order for me to do this and do it successfully? That look, I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to do, you know, all the sadhana in the morning. I'm very busy. The answer to that will be, this needs no time management at all. Interesting, right? Isn't it? It doesn't need any time management, meaning we don't have to spend time to do all these different things. The answer is yes. What it needs is mind management. We need to manage the mind. What does that mean, mind management? You know, Bhagavad Mahapurana has a a beautiful verse that helps us to understand uh, what mind management means, meaning how do we use the mind to do this worship while we're doing everything else. This is really the best case scenario for a young child, you know, someone who's not interested in religiosity, but want to be spiritual and progress their spirituality. Bhagavad Puran helps us to understand. even, and there's no discouragement, please listen, uh, you know, uh, carefully. This is not a discouragement to do what we do. Whatever we do would add. Whatever physical we do would add to our, to our repertoire of, of, of activities that, that, that um, merit blessing, right? However, Bhagavad Mahapuran here says, this is, this is a Canto 11, uh, verse 27, chapter 8 of Bhagavad Mahapuran. That there are eight types of murtis that we have in Hinduism. Not eight gods, eight ways we can shape the form of God. Whether our preferred way, our preferred form of God is Shivaji, Mahalakshmi, Sri Krishna, Ram, Hanumanji, which, whichever. But there, in eight ways we can, we can create this murti. So the first one, Shaili Dadumai Lauhi Lepya Lekya Chasaikati. Shaili. That is, Murti can be made out, out of stone. We know that. Dadumai, wood. You can make a Murti out of wood. We also know that. Lauhi, we can make our Murti out of metal. Lekya, a Murti can be made out of paint. You know, paint, like we paint a picture on a piece of paper or a you know, canvas or something. Lepya, we can make murti out of a paste, you know, 
we make a paste, like we take mud and make it into a paste, or even the sandalwood murtis, they, you know, grind the sandalwood, make it into a dust, and make it into a paste, so that, you know, it can have a definition. Or sometimes they carve it as well, but, you know, a murti can be made out of some sort of paste. Saikati, murti can be made out of sand. You can take sand, you know, and cement, etc. Um, and this one is different. Remember the first one was stone, like as in marble stone. Then we can also take sand and cement and make a murti. We can also make a murti according to Bhagavad Mahapuran. This is one of the eight. Manomai. Manomai means a murti that is conceived in the mind. Man means mind. Mani mai. There's one other way that we can make murtis. Money means, you know, jewelry. Some people, you know, depend, depending on your affordability, you can make a murti with, with gold or, or with silver or whatever it is, right? Some jewelry. So those are the eight forms, the eight ways that we can make a murti. Now there are six saints, the scriptures, and anyone who has attained God, whether they're a rasik saint or a, or a jnani saint, you know, you ask a yogi or a, or a swami who has elevated themselves, and they'll tell you that, um, I don't need a murti to pray. I can pray any way I want. But those are not the only ways we can, we can, we can make. We can make a murti in the mind, but those are not the only forms. Remember, you know, Svetashwar Upanishad helps us to understand further of the forms of God that we can see and imagine and create a relationship with. Tam Sri, Tam Pumanasi, Tam Kumar Utava Kumari, Tam Jirnona Dande Navahanchasi, Tam Jato Bhavasi, Shishwato Mukha. Here's what is interesting. Tam Sri. The, this is Yajurve, Svetashwar Upanishad, fourth chapter, third verse. Svetashwar Upanishad says the Tam Sri God is a woman, or can be a woman. Tam Puman, that God can be a man. Tam Kumar, God can be a young man, a boy. Utava Kumari, God can be a young girl. But here's the interesting one. Tam jirnona dandena vanchasi. God can also be an old man who walks with a stick. This covers all the different ways that we can see God. This is Ved. This is not my opinion. So for those people, you know, the older folks, they want some kind of companion, right? They want, they want to see God as a friend. So... so the older gentleman or woman, how, who would he see as a friend? Someone of, of his age. So he'll probably have an older person as his friend, his closest friend, which will be God. Because remember a few weeks ago, there are a few relationships that we can um, cultivate in order to um, skyrocket our devotion. We can do Sakya Bhav, you know, seeing God as a friend, or Dasya Bhav as a master and a servant, God being the master, Vatsalya Bhav, as mother and child, and Madhurya Bhav, lover and beloved. These are relationships that we can create with God or should create with God if we want to get closer to Bhagavan. Remember in the beginning, you know, a few minutes ago, we said that if we want to create a murti, then create this one. According to this sloka in Bhagavad, Sakrida, Sakrida yadanga pratimanta rahita manomai bhagavati dadaogatim manomai manomai bhagavatim dadaogatim manomai. The people who have attained God will tell you the best form, and this is Bhagavad Mahapuran, 10th Kanto, 12th chapter, 39 verses, saying the preferred form of God for a person who wants to practice a different level, a higher level of devotion, a person who wants to do uh, manas puja, mental worship, which is, which is the preferred way to worship, where you can chant God's name in your mind, but you want to have a murti as well as manomai, that murti that is made of the mind. So this is how simple it is to teach our children 
if we're getting if we're getting pushed back from our children as to they don't want to do all the things we're doing they're busy or we're busy and we're not able to worship so we understand that Sukhdev is saying that manomai make a murti of the mind and contemplate upon it so what's the best time these are questions we will have the child will ask you okay I know, mom, that you wake early in the morning and you take a shower and you wear a specific set of clothing and you have to face a particular direction and it has to be, a, um, you know, you have to get all these things. So if I'm going to do mental worship, what time do I have to do it? Hari Bhakti Vilas helps us to understand or answers that question. Nadesa niyamam tasmin nakala niyamas tatha Nadesha niyamas tasmin. Desh means place. There is no place. According to Raganuga Bhakti, nakala niyamas tatha. Kal means time. There is no place and there is no time that is specific for worship to God. This is Hari Bhakti Vilas chapter 11, uh, verse 408. No restrictions when it comes to doing bhakti of time and place. Because you remember Bhagavad Gita, we discussed this. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanusmara yudhyacha. What is, what is Sri Krishna saying to Arjun? Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. Arjun, at all places and at all times, the only requirement you have, remember me, Arjun, and do your duty. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. Remember me. That is the only requirement. And do your duty. Okay. So how can we go about doing that? Remember me and do your duty? Oh, we're so busy, we don't remember Bhagavan for five seconds in the day. We're too busy. We have work, then we come home, we have the children, we have laundry, we have weekends, we're, you know. We mean well, we want to, you know, take two hours off or an hour off or a sadhana, but we're busy. God knows that we're busy. Okay. So we're talking about spirituality, bhakti, for the young or the busy. So here's what you do. Here's a little trick you can use. When you're at work, set your watch, right? Everybody's got a smart watch these days. If even you don't, your regular watch to beep. At the top of the hour, okay? It's, it's 9 o'clock, so set your watch to beep. Why are you doing that? The, ment the plan, the mental plan is that when my watch beeps, I will very quietly by myself for five seconds think of Bhagwan, think of God, whatever form of God you prefer. And you'll find something to say to God. You can just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Bhagwan. Oh, God, I love you so much. I love you, God. I love whatever comes to your mind. Thank you for all you've been doing to me, for me. Oh, thank you for remembering. Just come up with something. Focus the mind on God for five seconds. That will be five seconds more than you would have done the last hour, maybe for the whole last day. And the next hour, let it beep again. Go from five seconds to 10 seconds to 15 seconds. Work your way up to trying to remember God 1% of the time that you have in a day. Is that asking too much? 1%? If you're able to remember God for 1%, you know, many, many years ago, my chacha from Canada, originally from Lenora, told me about one day he asked me a question. We were alone and said, do you know how many minutes there are in a day? And I had no idea. So he told me 440 minutes. I said, okay, good information, thank you. He goes like, no. What do you do with those 440 minutes? So I'm looking at him like, what kind of infringement of my privacy is this? What do you want to know, you know, what I do with this 1440 minutes? But I remember those numbers. It's 1440 minutes a day, and what do we do with them? So now if I tell you that if you invest one minute, 1% 1 of those 1440 minutes, this will be less than 15 minutes for a whole 24 hours. That if you do that, you'll start seeing miracles happening in your lives. Remembering God for 15 minutes a day. I don't mean doing actions, right? 
Listen carefully. Oh, you know, sir, I do a whole lot more than that. I don't see any miracles. Yes, you do. But where is the mind when you do it? Om Jai Jagadish Hari. We all pray like that. We all do arti. We all do it out of the, the love for God from our heart. But the requirement is mana eva manushyanam karanam bandha moksha yoha. That the mind alone will determine. The mind alone. This is Brahma Bindu Upanishad, verse 2. Mana eva means only. Only the mind will determine karanam bandha moksha yoha. If we become free, if we enjoy freedom in life, or bandha, moksha yo. Moksha yo means freedom, bandha means bondage. Or if we live struggling, the mind alone. So when we do these religious activities, they're excellent. We have to start there. We cannot start at the top. When you go to school, nobody goes to university first. However, we must work our way up. Try to remember God five seconds every after, and then 10 seconds. If you do 30 seconds a day, that's 30 seconds an hour. Um, 24, how many, that's 14 minutes. Um, that's around 14 minutes. If you get up to 30 seconds an hour, and no one has to see you. When you're at work, you don't even have to close your eyes. You don't have to say anything. Those are not the requirements. Listen carefully. This is a recipe for your children, all of us to become more spiritual. And there are tremendous benefits to be had if we do this. 30 seconds. Don't even close your eyes if you have people next to you to ask you, what are you doing? Are you sleeping? Sleeping on the job? <laughs> if you can, close your eyes, then go ahead. Just take five seconds off and remember God. Remember his leelas. Remember what he looks like. Say thank you, God. So work your way up to 1%, and I guarantee you that you'll start seeing miracles in your life. I want to leave with you a small um, an example of the difference that 1% change can make in your life. We'll, we'll, we'll do a, um, an example that actually something that actually happened, and then we'll move on quoting another scripture before we close. Uh, and this story has to do with professional, professional cycling in Great Britain, right? Cycling in, in Britain had endured nearly, nearly 100 years of, of of the way history puts it is mediocrity, 100 years of mediocrity. Since 1908, British riders had won just a single gold medal at the Olympic Games. One gold medal in almost 100 years. Cyclists, um, and, and in cycling's biggest race, which is called the Tour de France, in 110 years, it was already happening for 110 years, no British cyclist had won a Tour de France. It was so bad for cyclists in, in Britain that top manufacturers in Europe didn't want to sell their bikes to them because they were too afraid that, you know, if, if someone else, another professional, sees a Brit riding their, their bicycles, you know, they may, they may lose sales. They don't want to see, you know, these people who can't win anything using their gear. However, that changed one day in 2003 when they hired a gentleman by the name of, uh, of Dave Brailsford. Dave Brailsford um, was the new performance director. And he had a, the reason why they hi hired him is because he had a strategy that he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. Right? That was Brailsford's uh, strategy. Basically, this was a philosophy of searching for tiny margins of improvement in everything you do. Small margins of improvement, nothing drastic, in everything you do in order to make a change, to effect a change. So the whole principle was that you know, if you broke down everything one knows regarding riding a bike or racing bike, and then you improve that by 1%, you'll see a significant increase when you put all those little changes together. So Brailsford started making very, very small adjustments. Uh, just to name a few, um, started redesigning the bike seats to make them more comfortable for the rider. They asked the riders to wear electrically heated overshorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature 
um, while riding. They had their outdoor riders switch to indoor racing suits, which proved to be lighter and more aerodynamic. Little, little changes. But they didn't stop there. They tested different types of even massage gels to see which one led to the fastest muscle recovery from the people who were riding. They actually went to the extent of hiring a surgeon to teach each rider the best way to wash their hands to reduce the chances of catching a cold. That's something that is familiar to us now with the pandemic, right? They went on to paint the inside of the truck white that transports these bicycles. Why? Because painting the truck inside white will help them to spot little bits of dust that would negatively affect the performance of, you know, finely tuned bikes. Just to name a few, Brailsford implemented hundreds of changes, all little, little changes, nothing more than 1% in each activity. But the improvements accumulated. The results came faster than anyone could have imagined. Just five years after Brailsford took over, the British cycling team dominated the, the road and track cycling events at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing. There they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. Remember, they didn't win anything for so long and so many Olympic Games. But not only that, four years later, when the Olympic Games came to London, the Brits set nine Olympic records and seven world records. That same year, a gentleman by the name of, of Bradley Higgins became the, the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The very next year, his teammate, a guy by the name of Chris Froome, he won the race, and he would go on to win the Tour de France in 2015, 16, and 17. The British team won five Tour de France victories in six years. And during the 10 year span from 2007 to 2017, British cyclists won 178 world championships and 66 Olympic and Paralympic gold medals. That record is widely regarded as the most successful run in cycling history. How? By making 1% changes, 1% change at a time. So what we're trying to do here with our spirituality, we're trying to get to remembering God because we know the benefits of the um, of one percent. We know that if we use five seconds and then ten, then go up to thirty seconds an hour, which will cost no or nothing, that we can start seeing miracles in our lives by making one percent change. So, because Bhagavan is saying, remember we we talked about before that there is no time and there is no place. So essentially, Bhagavan is saying that remember me while you do your duties. Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu, this is what he said to Arjun. Just remember me, Arjun, and go ahead. Do your work. This is how we'll do that. So um, to help us to further understand how we'll be able to, to do this, how can we improve in just thinking? There's one more requirement. We'll look at that requirement before we finish today. Um, Bhagavad Mahapurana helps us to, in, to understand what that requirement is. Radha Ramana Radha Ramana Gopi Jan Jeevana Radha
श्रवणम कीर्तनम ध्यानम हरे भूत कर्मण जन्म कर्म गुणानाम च तदर्थे किल चेष्टिम राधार Again, in Bhagavad Mahapuran, this is uh, the 11th canto, the third chapter, 27th verse. Bhagavad Mahapuran says, "Shravanam kirtanam dhyanam." We talked about these words. Shravanam means to hear, kirtanam means to chant, dhyanam means to remember. That one should hear, glorify, and meditate upon God. But when do we do that? We do that, you know, at different times. But how about the fact that we don't have any time in our lives? We're very busy. You know, some people have two jobs. Some people are, you know, very established business people. They they spend a lot of time at work and things like that. So, what will happen to those people? Especially if you know, if you're working over the weekend, for example, you have left Sunday to do your worship, and all of a sudden you have to work on Sundays. This verse tells us. How do we take that or those activities that we do and make them into worship? This verse tells us that Sri Krishna says here in Bhagavad Mahapuran that all the things we do on a daily basis. I don't want to start mentioning the names here, you know, in in very great detail. But essentially, what the verse means: whatever one finds pleasing. Whatever you find pleasing, firstly, one should offer all their performances, all your activities that are done during the day, everything that you perform, everything that you do, should be done as an offering to me. This is essentially what the verse says. You can check it out. I give you the. The um, where it's from, right? Uh, the verses from Bhagavad Mahapuran, um, you know, the the eleven canto. So we can we can look at that whenever we want. You know, chapter canto eleven or chapter twenty seven, twenty eight um, verses. Now, what the verse is saying is that all the activities that you perform during the day. For whatever reason, whether this is business, whether it's pleasure, whatever it is, offer them all to me. Now, what changes here? Just the mindset. We've been doing this all this time, but the verse goes beyond that. Priyam, daran, means a wife, a spouse. Sutan, sons. Grihan, home. Pranan, vital air. Everything that you have and enjoy should be given to me as an offering. Our family as well, my wife, my husband, my children. Yes, this is what Bhagwan is saying. What we do to make this a little bit clearer is that if you're working to maintain the family, you make that as an offering to God. That my dear Lord, O Krishna, O Shivji, O O, o Durga Mai, you have given me these children. You have given me a family. You have given me a house because of your grace. Now today I have the responsibility to take care of my family. The wife and the husband—they all say the same thing. Everybody works. That I have to go to work. I don't have too much time to do all my sadhana that I would like to do in front of my altar or sit in meditation for hours. But thank God for your children, your spouse, and your house, and offer it all to Him. Not physically. You don't have to sign anything over or tell the Swamiji or the Pandit that you know I've given this to God. Some some guy might claim to be God and come. You know, he'll want it in your mind. Offer even 
your duties that you do towards family, wife and children, towards community, towards the mandir, the charity that you give, offer it all to Bhagavan. Bhagavad Gita helps us to understand. This is a very popular verse, you know, chapter 9, verse 27. Yat karoshi yarasnasi yajur hoshi dadasi yat. Bhagavan says there in Bhagavad Gita, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer as an oblation to the sacred fire, whatever you bestow as a gift, this means charity. Whatever austerities you perform, O Arjun, offer them all to me. So with those small steps as a system, my dear souls, my dear friends, if we use that and start a system, a mental system, then you'll develop stronger and stronger love for God on a daily basis. And you'll reach your goal. But we have to have a system. And the system is that we try to remember God starting with five seconds, and then we go up to 30 seconds if we can, and do more if you can. And the activities that you do during the day, instead of just seeing it as something that you do for the family and for community, you will get rewards for those, but it will be short-term material rewards. We want to do the same thing and attain God's grace. Long-term, divine merits, we want. And by offering those activities to Bhagavan, using that system, you will be able to attain that goal. You will reach your goal, undoubtedly. You know, there's a beautiful quote from a gentleman named Scott Adam. He says that goals are about the results you want to achieve. However, systems are the processes that lead to those results. So just don't only have a goal and don't have any system to accomplish that goal. That is wishful thinking, goals without the system. You want to wake up early? You want to wake, oh, I'm going to wake, you know, 5 o'clock from tomorrow morning. It's not going to happen. You need to change, you know, two hours before, an hour before. You need to come off your your iPad or your screen, whatever you use, stop watching TV. You need to go to bed earlier. You need to do the things that are going to help you to compensate for that hour of sleep. You need to have a system. Going to bed the same time, doing all the same things you've been doing and planning to wake up one hour early, it's not going to happen. Why? Because you have no system. So little bits at a time. Start with five seconds and you'll experience a shift in mindset. You'll experience a shift in consciousness. And your mind will be absorbed in God while doing your material duties. You'll become like the person fetching the goblet. Remember, we'll, we'll close here, but if you go to India, for those of you who've gone or watched movies, you'll see the ladies in the countryside, they're fetching a goblet, you know, ghara, an earthen pot, a big one, they're fetching water from the well, and they're going home, and sometimes they walk for miles. They're walking for miles, and they have friends next to them. They're turning their heads to this side, to the other side, and sometimes they stop to talk to a neighbor, and they're having a full-fledged conversation. They're turning backwards, all kinds of things they're doing, and the goblet doesn't fall. Why? Because they're doing all their activities, but as we say in Guyana, the back of their head, in their subconscious, the goblet on top of their head, they're always cognizant of that. They're always aware of that. They know it's there. They're doing the things to ensure it stays there and it doesn't fall. But they do all their other duties, walking, talking, turning their heads, etc. So this is the mindset to which we have to get. While we're doing all our duties, but right there, in our brain, in our consciousness, in our mind, we know that God is there watching us and we're doing this for him. If we get to that point to do our duties, we'll eventually develop love for God and we will attain his grace. Why did I say love? Because Ramayana helps us to understand um, that Hari Vyapaka Sarvatra Samana Premate pragat hoi mai jana. Premate pragat. The God is revealed in the mind of that person who loves him. How do we develop love? We wake up one morning and say, today we'll start loving God. That's not going to happen. Start thinking of God five seconds at a time. 
And when you do that, you'll develop love for him because you'll appreciate all the things he's doing in your life, giving you the chance to breathe, etc. So wholehearted, you know, Ramayana tells us, Manakrama Bachana Chori Chaturai. Wholehearted, dedicated, selfless devotion with feelings of love ensures God's grace. God says this. So these are, these are the unparalleled benefits that we can get. Uh, just before I close, I just want to close, you know, I thought of one more example that I want to share with you. I'll share it quickly. Um, because the question can be asked, if we perform this bhakti that you're talking about, um, would I get the same benefits? Because I live in this world, I, I need to, you know, strength to work and the things that we need to maintain our family. So there's a beautiful verse in Bhagavad Mahapurana that says, um, Yata karma birata pasa jnana vairagyata sayat yogena dana dharmena seyo bhiritarairapi. Bhagavan says here in Bhagavad Mahapuran, 11 Kanto, 20th chapter, 32nd and 33rd verse. Bhagavan says that that which is obtained by fruitive actions, all the things that we do, thinking that if we do this and if we do that, we'll attain God's grace, we'll get his blessings, right? We see the need to do certain things in religion, if we want to attain something. We all grew up like that, and I can understand that. We all still do that. This verse is saying, everything that can be achieved by fruitive actions, everything that can be achieved by penance, everything that can be achieved by knowledge, by detachment, by yoga, and by charity. You know, we give charity sometimes. Charity is supposed to be given in a particular way. That's a different topic, rather. Um, excuse me. Uh, but the rewards that we will get if we give charity, thinking that in giving that we receive, even in charity, religious duties and other means of perfecting life, all these things are easily achievable through loving service unto God. That is what that verse means. So if a devotee desires, you know, promotion to heaven, this verse also tells us, if you want liberation, moksha. If you want residence in my abode, a devotee easily attains all of that according to that verse. So the question you'll have in your mind now, really? We can attain all those things just by doing those little things you talked about, practicing bhakti? Yes, you can. We'll close with this doha. The question you'll have, is there any proof to what you're saying? And so. I will take up a, a doha from Ramayan to see the proof and then we shall close. If we only do bhakti, we can get all those things. Is there any proof? Bhagwan Sri Ram himself is talking to Kaag Vasundi. And he's telling Kaag Vasundi that I am extremely pleased with you today. Kaag Vasundi is a devotee. Ati prasanna mohi jan. Kagusundi today, I'm very pleased with you. That manguvar, kagusundi manguvar, ask me for anything. Whatever you want, ask me for. This is Sri Ram telling a devotee. Whether you want anima dika siddhi, aparnidhi. Anything you want, you can even want siddhis. 
the eight Mahasiddhis. You know what that is? You know, like Hanumanji, Ashta Siddhi, Naonidhi. Hanumanji has Ashta Siddhi. These are psychic powers. Sri Ram is telling a devotee, ask me for anything. If, if you want this, these Mahasiddhis, I'll give them to you, know, Anima, Anima, Mahima, Garima, etc. There are eight of them. The ability to reduce your size to the size of an atom. The ability to grow bigger than a mountain. Garima, the, you can become heavier than the heaviest mountain, etc. Or if you want pleasures of like Kubir, you know, Kubir is the lord of wealth in Swarit. You want treasures like Kubir, I'll give you that too. Inexhaustible treasures. Or if you want liberation, whatever you want, Kagusundi, ask me, I'm ready to give it to you. Now I'm very satisfied with the devotion you've performed. I will give them to you. Now, as a devotee, what happens? We have the world. The world is, is, is our oyster. But just for information's sake, Kaag Busundi, because he was such an elevated devotee, he knew the things that were temporary and he knew the things that were permanent. At that stage in his life, he said, Bhagwan, just give me Abhirala Bhakti Vishuddha Ki Abhirala Bhakti Vishuddha Tau Sunipurana Jehi Gava Jehi Khojata Yogi Shamuni Prabhu Prasad Koi Pav. At that point in time, Kagusundi, he asked for bhakti. So, my dear, uh, my dear friends, um, that is evidence that with our bhakti, we can attain all the things that you ever wanted to attain. But we will know what is the great, greater importance. We will know what we need to do to attain Bhagavan. So, this is not only a recipe for success over this pandemic, we all like to find some kind of recipe, you know. This is a recipe for the eternal pandemic of life, the eternal pandemic of this world. There's always something going on. Every time we came as a human being, we faced these problems. And this is not the only one we'll face. We faced them in the past, and we'll continue to face them in the future. So what do we do? Every time there's a pandemic, we run to Bhagavan and do sadhana? That is bribery. Because blessings, my friends, are not, they're not asked for. Blessings are earned. And so when we do bhakti, we're earning our blessings. You know, if you have a house, and you know after 15 or 20 years that a roof will start leaking, what do you do? You wait until it starts to leak, and you say, okay, now let me start saving some money. I have to change the roof. You don't do that, right? Nobody does that. They put a little bit away for a rainy day. So when the roof starts leaking, they have something in their account. In a similar manner, we have to start making deposits into our spiritual bank accounts. We have to build a portfolio that is pregnant with, 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 with positive uh, preservation. And by that, I mean we make deposits into our spiritual bank accounts by implementing these very minute steps in our lives. So that our withdrawals, when it's time to make withdrawals in the time of need, like in a pandemic or other disasters, our withdrawals will come in the form of God's protection. You know, finding this, these, these disasters will come finding us brimful in confidence and perpetual peace in our mind because we've been depositing in our spiritual bank account for so long. So if you follow this model, then um, this, if you follow this recommendation, Bhagwan says, if you remember, Name Bhakta Pranashyati, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 31, Bhagavad Gita says, if you do these things, Name Bhakta Panashyati, my devotees will never perish. These are God's words. Sri Krishna himself. My devotees will never perish. Verse 31, chapter 9. So, these are the few things you want to remember. Mrityu Sansara Sagarat. That if we do these things firstly, we will be able to stop the cycle of birth and death. Um, if that is something we desire. And that everything can be achieved 
or anything that can be achieved by religious activities and pious activities can be achieved through practicing bhakti. That this is a recipe for the busy and the less religious people. That we should set our watch to remember Bhagwan five seconds every hour and work your way up to possibly 30 seconds. And when you start remembering God for that kind of time every day, miracles will undoubtedly happen in your lives. So let's put the wheels in motion today. As Jim Clare uh, says here in part that your outcomes, if you want that outcome, he says that our outcomes are a lagging measure of our habits, right? This is how it, it, it says that your, your net worth is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning habits. Your clutter is a lagging measure of your cleaning habits. That you get what you repeat. Similarly, your insufficient and inconsistent peace and fulfillment are a lagging measure of your spiritual habits. So let's put our spiritual habits in play. My dear friends, this small bhajan that we'll sing will help us to understand that if we do our bhakti and do it sincerely, then we'll be able to attain God's grace. We close with a small bhajan. Excuse me, I just have to find my bhajan here. Thank you. Um, प्रेम की अगन हो भक्ति सघन हो मन में लगन हो तो प्रभु मिल जाएंगे that ignite the fire of love प्रेम की अगन अगन means fire भक्ति सघन हो true intense devotion and what will मन में लगन remember मन your devotion has to be done through the mind that's the most powerful way to worship mind that's why we do meditation it's worship through the mind if we do that, then what happens? Prabhu mil jayenge. Mil jayenge means to achieve, to attain, to meet with, to mix with, with Prabhuji, with Bhagavanji. Prem ki agan ho, bhakti saghan ho, man me. प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रेम की अगन हो भक्ति सगन हो मन में लगन हो तो प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे Prabhu Hare 
चाहेंगे प्रभु हर चाहेंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रेम की अगन हो भक्ति सगन हो मन में लगन हो तो प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे प्रभु मिल जाएंगे वृंदावन बिहारी लाल की जय